good afternoon. Uh, I wasn't really sure what I was going to be uh, focusing on, and, uh, and this may, may seem very uh, general for, for, for some of you, but I, I just ask you to, to, to put it into context on, on the particular aspects that you'd be uh, interested in. Uh, I'm going to talk about mobility and placemaking and talk about place that, uh, that John um, referred to and the importance of mobility um, on it. So the, that's, that's the, first, the first part of my, my presentation will be uh, the importance of, of mobility and place in urban environments. I'll go on to uh, talk about addressing the balance between uh, travel modes. Again, things that we've been uh, talking to about um, throughout, throughout this, this, this day. Then the cornerstones of, of mobility and placemaking from my point of view. So how can mobility, what are the aspects of mobility that we need to look at when we're looking into placemaking? And the key ingredient, which from my opinion, which is creativity and I dare say fun. Um, cities are living structures. They, they're born at some point, they grow, they die, they regenerate, they they are, they are living structures. They, I, that's the way I see it. That's the way I'm sure that a lot of us um, see them. Movement really is the blood that makes them function. Without, without movement, cities are not what they are. And they, they definitely don't, um, don't thrive. Um, and sometimes they wouldn't die either. Um, <coughs> And in, within urban environments, we're talking about having links and places um, uh, at the same time. So the, the, they, generally, the essence of urban life is really found on the places um, rather than the links, um, even though the links are essential for the places to, to, to survive. So you know, the design focus of a, of a link would be to save time, there would be ve vehicles. The design focus of, uh, of place would be to spend time. So there's completely divergent um, uh, focus um, and objects of design, uh, but they both exist in our cities and everywhere that we know is somewhere in between uh, a link and, um, and, and a place, um, in, in a sense, because a place facilitates movement. Uh, people need to move from place to place and through places, but it also facilitates the lack of movement, which in, which in essence defines movement. It can be bustling, but it can be quiet. All of these are spaces and places that we understand, that, that we deal with um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But most of the places that are successful, in my opinion, tend to integrate all components. They're not, neither one or the other. Um, they tend to be flexible, and, and, I, and I'll get on to that a bit later. So how do we address the balance between travel modes? I mean, I'm not going to say how do we do it, I'm just going to give my opinion and give some examples of, of how it's not done. Because there's something unbalanced or inadequate about these, these, um, these images. One of them is actually John's, <laughs> and I didn't know that. Um, but um, thank you for that, John. <laughs> and, um, but we, we, we see people here that obviously that are walking in the middle of the street because cars are parked on the footway or because there is no footway. There's people trying to get to places going over, over barriers. There's people that are stopped in a sheep pen, um, it, there's nothing, there's no, there's, there's an, it's unbalanced and ina inadequate as I say there. But here's a space that is actually flexible, balanced. It looks like a pedestrianized street, however it's not. Uh, in fact, there's that lady to, uh, pushing a, uh, a buggy with a, with, a, with a car passing by and uh, this happy mother and child about to be run over by a, by a truck, uh, but they weren't, I, I can assure you that. Um, there's the, the, the elderly uh, gentleman and lady just uh, crossing the road after the truck is passed. This is flexibility. This is, this is a street acting as a link and a place at the same time, um, seamlessly. People seem happy. Um, so what are the cornerstones? What we need to look at? If we want to achieve something like that, in, in each case is a case, Pedestrian desire lines. It, we, for those of you who don't understand Portuguese, which um, probably the majority, that, that, that top um, image uh, just says entry to the station. So somebody just decided that is, that is where they want to go into the station. They don't want to go around the station. They just want to go through there. But obviously, somebody decided that, yes, if zebra crossing was in the right place, but where is it leading? People want to get into the station that way. 
Uh, I believe that there is a, a gate very near this now, uh, after this uh, little bit of um, agitation. Um, but you, you see examples of how pedestrian desire lines were not accommodated. They weren't thought of. You see, you see the, the, the monumental square there that looked brilliant, but nobody thought that people would actually want to go through it from one, um, one corner to the other rather than around it. And of course, the, the people do what they want. Sometimes they have to force the, 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 the fence. Uh, sometimes they just have to walk through the lawn. Here's some ideas, some wacky ideas, but they, they actually reveal that thinking and say, where do people want to go to and from? And how can we accommodate that, even at the small detail of um, the, the, the shape of the zebra crossings? Uh, all of these, are, you know, Oxford Circus there, uh, that is quite successful. I mean, whoever knew Oxford Circus before um, and, and knows it now just sees how, how, how different the place it is, just for a simple, simple arrangement that the, the traffic engineers would have uh, sorted the signals and, and just uh, realized that they can actually do uh, diagonal crossings. Here's an example. This is a small project that I, that I worked on in, in Bettystown in County Mead. And just an example of how mobility considerations and pedestrian desire lines um, can actually be looked from, from the beginning. We were asked to look into uh, improvements to, to the center of Bettystown. It's, it's not a big place, so this is pretty much the center. Um, but there's a beach, there's a, there's, um, there's a road going through it and a road leading from the, from the west, and there's a, a series of attractors. So we've plotted the, the desire lines, the direct desire lines between all of these places, so entering into this center and then all of the attractors within, uh, and then we've, we've plotted them where the where these pedestrian desire lines would actually be able to be accommodated. Of course, they can't go through buildings, they can't go through, through, through the streets um, full of cars. So this is the way that they are accommodated. But really, there's areas that are very desirable for crossing, but they were not catered by any type of facilities. And we came up with some improvements that not only had, had a focus on, on slowing traffic down, but also a focus on putting the pedestrian crossings where the pedestrian crossings were needed. It sounds simple and obvious, but m more often than not, this is not thought about. And I, now I almost regret not having my next slides, which I took off, which were to do with um, Grand Canal Square, where the pedestrian desire lines actually appear to be, um, um, appear to be ad addressed through the design and the the design on, but the main desire line that comes from Pierce Street all the way um, northwards actually ends in the middle of a junction. And this is, this is a, an award-winning uh, design, and it's what I call the, the, red, the, the red line syndrome, that's the, the, the scheme ended there, so everything worked if you only looked at the scheme, but the desire line actually ends in the middle of a junction, not at the crossing, in the middle of a junction. If you sit there at lunchtime and you see all the cyclists whizzing past, they end and they get scared because they, they fa f uh, find themselves in the middle of a junction. So I decided not to, not to have that. I, I decided to, to skip, but I couldn't help myself now. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is clutter. It's the, some of you know me or, or, or heard some presentation from me know that this is one of my uh, crusades. I, I, I just think it's, it's nonsense in, in these islands especially. Uh, the amount of clutter we put in uh, in the name of, of traffic regulations and, and safety and security. This is actually a scheme in Cambridge where the scheme in itself is a sustainable transport scheme. It's actually to make the city, the city center, more attractive to people. It's to stop cars from going into the center and let buses go in so you keep your attractiveness, you keep your uh, accessibility and so on. However, there's, I don't know how many of these, four, five, six, seven, eight, I don't know, of these bus gates surrounding this historic uh, city center. So, you know, the remedy actually ruined what was trying to, to, to sort. And I just decided to clutter my clutter um, uh, slide just to, to, make a, to make a stronger point. I think clutter is uh, something that we have the responsibility of being aware of and try to sort it somehow. 
here's places that are not cluttered. But they, they do work. I mean, this, the, the one on the, the, on, the, on the bottom left is actually the center of Berlin. Um, there's no clutter there. There's buses, there's cars, there's people, there'll be cyclists, there's cyclists there actually. There's, there's hardly any clutter, but so we're able to do this. We're not talking about small streets only. The over-design of the road infrastructure, I think this is something that plagues our cities. Um, this is something that I heard a long time ago somebody mention, and I just think it just tells it. The multiple flush syndrome. It would be if we designed drainage infrastructure for the eventuality that everybody flushes the toilet at the same time, you'd have 10 meter wide diameter pipes going through cities, just in case, just in case. You don't do that because you apply a level of logic. So why do we do that to streets? It's the same as having a bin lorry, a fire truck, an ambulance, people, everybody coming in at the same time and crashing. So let's design these big things like this. You know, there's 64 houses there. It's a quiet road. Why do we need 26 meters between that? This is, this is auto tracked for two articulated trucks to pass at the exact same time. It can only be because there's no other reason. But what it does is that it makes the crossing much longer and it makes cars take the turn much faster. So it's a double whammy against pedestrians. Or it does this. I know this is historical, this is the M Street, but 75% of the space, roughly, is given to vehicular circulation. But vehicular circulation is not 75% of the, of, of the, um, of the foot for or the, the occupiers of the street. Maybe it's less than what it could be if it was a more attractive space. And we, uh, we alluded to, the, to, to this um, before uh, Adele has alluded to it. So it doesn't have to be that way. There's places that are um, attractive. I mean, there's, there's places abroad, but also there's, that's Dundalk on the top, on the top, um, on the top left. So it's not, we don't need to look, not anymore, we don't need to look um, uh, abroad to find some good examples of how streets can, can be um, rebalanced. Critical mass is another issue that I, that I have. Critical mass, people, are really important in the success of, 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 of schemes. They are extremely important. We tend to see schemes as this. They are like this. They, 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 we want them to be like this. We sell them like this to, to, to clients, to authorities. We say, this is going to be brilliant. However, and these are two schemes that I, that I worked on, one of them, a lot of you recognize as Grange Gorman. The other one is a, a scheme in Russia. Uh, however, there will be another scheme next to uh, the scheme that you're selling that is selling it in the same way. And then another one there, and another one there. And also, there's the issue of different times of the day. These places need to be... Um, this is the same street in Copenhagen. Um, at different times of the day. This was in the winter, so... Even though it was, it was probably four o'clock when I took that one, it looks like night, but, um, but can be very busy and can be very quiet. Also different times of the year. Same place again in, uh, in, in Copenhagen where um, you can have this bustling place and are, are completely empty. So how, this, how does the place actually work throughout the year, throughout the day? This is extremely important and it came, it came about when we were thinking of Grange Gorman as a, as a university campus. And, that, that works on 32 or 34 weeks a year, uh, and what happens after? And are the public spaces, are all of those spaces that we want populated, occupied by all of this population that's going to be there 34 um, weeks a year, what's going to happen? Which are, those, which are the spaces that are going to have the residual um, users? And that's very important to think of in, in critical mass in time, but also in space, that we cannot have vibrant places everywhere. And we need to own up to that at some point. Because not all spaces will be like this at, at all times. You know, vibrancy is great to see, and, uh, but sometimes they can actually be successful without the crowds because they have to be different places. Creativity. 
and as I said before, fun. I think that the functionality is the most important, I think, uh, function of a, of a, of a place uh, or, or aspect of a place. But we need to think of, of imagination for a number of reasons. First, because we need to enjoy the places we're in. Second, because we need to, as planning for cities and for neighborhoods and for places, we need to set them apart somehow. We can't all be uh, using the same uh, ingredient. Um, we need to set them apart. Uh, places and, and placemaking has a, a great um, role to play in, in the ownership that people have of those places, and that is reflected then on the, on the care that people have and the litter that was mentioned earlier on and the safety. And it's, it's a positive domino effect. Once you, once you do something special about a place, people feel special about that place and everything else uh, follows from there. So I'm going to give just some examples of, of places that I, I think are, um, they're all different, but they all have something different. They, all, they, all, they are all original. Somebody thought about doing something different, uh, something out of the norm. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce that name of that um, uh, square, but it's in Norrköping in, um, in Sweden. Uh, I think it's a brilliant, brilliant scheme. I, I heard it, it works very, very well. Um, and it's, it's a traffic junction. Um, but it, it just, it just sets, sets the place apart. This is in Lisbon, my home city. Uh, literally, it was supposed to be a temporary intervention. Everywhere they painted the, the, the ground pink. This was, this was the red light district in Lisbon. Uh, it was a no-go area, really, for, for um, uh, decent people. Um, <laughs> and, and really, they wanted to regenerate. This is now the most buzzing place in, uh, in Lisbon at the moment. You know, the, the, the shift has changed, has, has moved here for nightlife and so on. And it started with the Pink, Pink Street. It was supposed to be uh, there and gone in two months, and uh, three years later, still there. Uh, the accident in Leeuwarden. Um, if anyone has been to Leeuwarden, you know, they, they suffered with a bombing during the war and so on. It's, it's a very uninteresting um, uh, place. It's nothing, nothing major to it. That square particularly has the dimensions all wrong. It was one of those uh, interventions in the, in, the, in, the, in the 60s or the 70s that just got it wrong. But that's not the end of it. You know, you can actually bring something. You can, you know, why would I be taking a photo, or, or I, I didn't take this photo, but are using a photo of Leo Harden anywhere? I am. I'm doing it because somebody thought this was brilliant. And isn't it? I think it is amazing. The same thing in Drafton, very near Leo Harden, where they decided to um, uh, do an urban river. Um, this was temporary, but it just put it on the map. It just brought people to think about their street and what's wrong and what's right about the street. This is in Copenhagen, Super Killen, and uh, it's, it's, it's a series of, of different uh, style public spaces. He's in the, he's a, let's call it a deprived neighborhood of Copenhagen. There's no such thing as a deprived neighborhood in Copenhagen as far as I see it, but, uh, but they, they think it is. Um, it's, it just brought it to not only it brought it to, to the map, but it got people to get some ownership over the, um, over the space. Um, it actually links places. It is a route for pedestrians that was opened up. But it was opened up with, with different, it's, it's still being, um, different sections are still being built, all with different uh, languages and landscaping languages, which is really interesting. The very colorful one, the one that has uh, the black and white and, and it's it's really really interesting place really interesting. This is now gone. It was temporary. It was supposed to be like there for a year. It's it's now gone because a bigger thing is coming in, uh, 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 landscaping intervention. But all they did was take a car park off um, near the uh, uh, one of the main stations in in Lisbon and a ferry terminal. There was a car park right by the river. They took the car park off. They kept the tarmac and they put these fiberglass uh, planters that you can actually move and bring your tree with you and you can cluster them if you're there chatting with friends, you can move them to turn them to the river, turn them to the, to the square. It was an amazing success. success. Um, very simple, simple intervention, but somebody actually spent a little bit of time thinking, and say, okay, no, this may be a good idea and put it in place. 
This is not as cheap. Um, it's, uh, it's in Switzerland. But again, Singalen. Would I be talking about Singalen if it wasn't for, for this red square? Uh, it, it, I wouldn't, but I am talking about Singalen. And, um, and, uh, and I think it's that imagination put into, into, um, into, uh, into action that puts gives people ownership of the of the place of their city of the way the city is uh, is developing thank you very much <laughs>